from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The 1995 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures on the double life of RNA will be presented by Dr. Thomas R. Check, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, distinguished professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, and 1989 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry. The third lecture will discuss how to accelerate a reaction 100 billion times using only RNA. And now, to introduce our program, the Vice President for Grants and Special Programs of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Joseph Perpich. Good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you again, the students here in the auditorium, and the teachers and students in schools across the country to the second day of the 1995 Holiday Lectures on Science. We're delighted that you've joined us again to hear Dr. Thomas Check continue his lectures on the double life of RNA. Dr. Check is a distinguished professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. In his lecture, lectures yesterday, Dr. Check took us on an exploration of the world of RNA. With him, we were molecular voyagers on a journey to see how he and his scientific colleagues found that RNA does more than carry information. It can, without the help of any other enzymes, splice itself into different molecular arrangements. With that discovery, the world of biology as we knew it changed. Before then, it was considered likely that DNA or proteins were the original molecules that gave rise to life forms on Earth. Now we know it is more likely that RNA is the key molecule in the evolution of life forms. We have yet to crack the cosmic code to explain the origins of the universe, but Dr. Check and his colleagues have helped unravel another thread in the mystery of the origins of life on Earth. As Dr. Chopin, the Institute's president, noted yesterday, the promise has never been greater for science to improve the health and welfare of people around the world in the 21st century. Through this nation's schools, colleges, and universities, the doors to the world of science were opened to Tom Check. Here at the Institute, we want that world opened not only to the 1% of young people who will pursue research and teaching careers, but also the 99% who will not. We want each generation of new students, like you here in this audience and in the audience, our television audience, to have an open door to a lifetime of science learning. Tom Check has a commitment, a commitment to kindle and rekindle the interests of students in science. This morning we have a brief video in which Dr. Check talks of his commitment to reaching to teaching and to reaching out to students, as his teachers and mentors did to him when he was a student. Following the video, he will give, a brief, he will give his third lecture in this series and explain how, using only RNA, a reaction can be accelerated a hundred billion times. Following his lecture, there will be an opportunity once again for questions and answers for the students in the auditorium. Then we will take a break and return promptly at 11.30 for the fourth lecture. Once again, on behalf of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, let me extend a warm welcome to everyone here and to all of our television viewers as we begin the second day of the 1995 Holiday Lectures on Science. My whole goal as an educator is to present material to people so that no matter what level they're at, they can feel good about getting to the next level. I think that science can be captivating for average students as it is for, high, for the high achievers because there are so many things in our everyday lives and in the everyday newspaper that we, that we read that, that can be related to the material in science courses. I think the general public perceives that there's a lot of homogeneity in the type of people who are good scientists. And it would be a pretty dull job if that were the case. The truth is that people with an incredible wide range of personalities, from people who are very patient data collectors to wild men and wild women, people with a wide variety of training, um, personality traits, skills in very different areas can contribute 
a lot to scientific discoveries. But it isn't always true that the people who are the brilliant uh, high school students who get the highest grades on the exam are the ones who do well as practicing experimental scientists because there are a lot of skills that uh, in doing experimental science that can't be tested on standardized exams. So although uh, good mathematical ability, good quantitative ability, uh, good analytical thinking ability are part of being a good scientist, there's a very hard to quantitate element of maybe it's sort of like being a good cook, you know, sort of knowing when to put a dash of this and a dash of that and then taste it and decide how to adjust it. That can make for a very good scientist and uh, it should be encouraging to those students who are the B students in high school and the B students in college that very often they are the ones who end up doing the um, really great work in, in research. If you love science in high school and now you go to the university and you become discouraged by it, uh, and decide that um, maybe you don't, you know, chemistry sounded fun or physics sounded fun in high school, but now as the material changes, you don't like it as much, don't necessarily give up your interest in science. Instead, you can move over to a different area, explore a different area of science, and often you'll find something that really suits your, your character. So be persistent in your interest in science and don't let one discouraging experience talk you into being a business major. Good morning and welcome to the third lecture on the double life of RNA. Uh, today I'm talking as a biochemist. You can see that biochemist isn't too much different from a molecular biologist. I'm the same person. I simply have a different sweater on. Uh, but I use the word biochemist to emphasize the fact that we're going to spend some time exploring the question of reaction mechanism, the question of how does a folded RNA molecule provide both the high specificity and the tremendous rate acceleration uh, that is characteristic of catalysis. And then uh, in the second part of the lecture, I'll talk a bit about what that structure of the RNA is that uh, promotes these reactions. So let's begin by uh, looking where we were yesterday at the uh, process of, first of all, copying of the RNA from uh, a DNA molecule, the process of transcription. And then once we have this precursor RNA, it needs to be cut at points X and Y and uh, rejoined to give a functional RNA molecule. So the question is, uh, how is this RNA splicing achieved? How are points X and Y chosen? And uh, what is the exact mechanism by which this rearrangement is facilitated? And you'll see that it is not done by cutting at points X and Y and rearranging, but by a slightly different pathway, which is shown here. So the uh, RNA, first of all, folds up and uh, this green line is meant to represent the intron portion and I, I draw it as a, as a uh, so, uh, sort of a strange shaped molecule just to emphasize the fact that it has a, a particular structure. Then the left hand site, the X site from the previous slide that needs to be cut is designated by a base pairing interaction between a portion of the intron, which is called the internal guide sequence, first named by Wayne Davies, a, a worker from England. And this internal stretch of nucleotides within the uh, intron pairs with a series of nucleotides exactly preceding the site where the RNA needs to be cut. I always find it easy to remember this sequence because it's CU, 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 which is the Colorado University repeated three times. That was totally um, by chance, I assure you. And then uh, the intron also provides a binding site for guanosine, which is, or GTP, 
either one can work in the reaction, either the triphosphorylated form or just plain guanosine. The important part of the guanosine is that it's, is its a hydroxyl group, an OH group, which uh, if this were part of an RNA chain, that OH group would be joined to the next uh, nucleotide in the chain, but in this case it's just a, a free monomer unit, and there's a site that binds that guanosine on the RNA. And then the guanosine acts, uh, if you're a chemist, it's called a nucleophile, but since you haven't had much chemistry yet, let's just think of it as a little pair of molecular scissors that cuts the RNA chain by a reaction that's called a transesterification reaction. And in that process, the guanosine becomes attached to the end of the intron RNA, and that frees up the exon, the, the part of the RNA that needs to be spliced, and it now has a hydroxyl group, which used to be, up here, was part of a linkage to the next nucleotide, to the A, but now it's a free OH group, and it can undergo a second transesterification reaction, which is really the, re the reverse, almost the reverse of the first transesterification. Well, normally if you do something forward and then reverse, you're back to where you started, but the reason that this isn't quite the reverse reaction is that there's been a conformational change. There's been a swapping of partners occupying this guanosine binding site. So up here it was a free guanosine from the cell that was bound into this site. Now it's a guanosine that is part of the intron itself. You can see this one that was uh, hanging out there has now bound into the guanosine binding site. So that now when a reaction that's essentially the reversal of the first step takes place because of this uh, change of occupancy of the guanosine binding site, the reaction goes on to produce the ligated exons. That's the product that the cell cares about. That's now the spliced RNA and to release the intron as a, a free molecule, which then in the cell is very rapidly degraded. Now let's look just a, at a little bit more detail at this process of transesterification, and you can see that the RNA chain uh, is, uh, this is the exon sequence, the last two uh, repeats of the CU, and then this is the beginning of the intron. Here's the guanosine, here's its OH group, and it attacks at a phosphate that joins the U and the A, and then the G becomes joined to the A, and now the U is released. So there are two questions that we have to address with respect to this um, transesterification reaction. How does it occur so quickly, and how is the accuracy or the specificity for a particular site uh, achieved. And I already told you a little bit about the accuracy question, that that base pairing interaction helped specify which uh, set of nucleotides would be immediately preceding the site where the RNA would be cleaved. Well, if we want to talk about uh, speed, it might be useful to know how fast would this reaction take place if it was not in a catalytic center. And that can be estimated uh, the rate of cleavage of an oxygen phosphorus bond uncatalyzed, and then we've measured the rate of cleavage of the oxygen phosphorus bond when it's wrapped up inside of the folded structure of the RNA. And the difference between these two numbers, this is a logarithmic scale, is 10 to the 11th fold. That's where the 100 billion times uh, comes from in the title of this lecture. So let's put that in terms of real numbers. It means that the reaction when catalyzed is taking place on the time scale of milliseconds. So a millisecond would mean it could take place a thousand times in the blink of an eye. And if it were uncatalyzed, it would take place on the time scale of hundreds of years. So you can clearly see that this amount of catalysis is the difference between the reaction taking place with enough frequency to be very suitable for a biochemical process, for something that has to go on uh, many times per second in a living cell, or if it was taking place uh, once every few hundred years, uh, you uh, wouldn't have a very useful rate of the reaction. So we have to explain, then, that large rate acceleration. 
the system we have used uh, is, as time goes on, less and less the intramolecular, within the same molecule, rearrangement seen in self-splicing, and more and more is an RNA enzyme version. So what we've done is to remove the green portion, the intron, which is the catalytic center, away from the parts of the molecule that are acted upon, shown in blue and purple. This catalytic entity now in solution does nothing. It just sits there, but when provided with another RNA molecule that contains the CUCUCU sequence, the two of them can get together by base pairing and now form a structure which is a bimolecular analog of what was occurring within a single molecule in self-splicing. In the presence of guanosine as the cutting uh, molecule or the nucleophile in the reaction, then a reaction that is an analog of the first step of self-splicing takes place. The uh, RNA is cleaved with guanosine attachment and the catalyst portion is restored in its original form so it can come back and grab another substrate molecule and go through this process multiple times. Why was it so important for us to divide this molecule into two pieces to make an RNA enzyme? Well, if we're interested in the questions uh, such as recognition of substrate by catalyst, it is very much advantageous to be able to, to change the concentration of the catalyst separately from the concentration of the molecule being acted upon, which we couldn't do in the case of self-splicing. In addition, using chemical synthesis, and I'll show you an example in a few minutes, we can uh, make the substrate molecule by organic chemical synthesis, and instead of putting just standard ribonucleotides at each position, we can put chemically altered bases or sugars or phosphates to ask very specific questions about how do each of those atoms on the molecule uh, contribute to either recognition of the substrate or to the, the rate of cleavage. And by having this molecule as a smaller molecule, it very uh, greatly facilitates the complete chemical synthesis. Although using more recent techniques, we've actually been able to make single atom substitutions within the large catalyst portion as well. I think it helps to put this catalytic cycle into a, a structural context that is a little bit more accurate. So here we see a model that was produced by two Frenchmen, uh, Francois Michel and Eric Westhoff, that shows two folded domains of the tetrahymena ribozyme. The one in, shown in purple includes, among other features, a binding site for guanosine, and the yellow arrow shows the direction that guanosine attacks. The uh, internal guide sequence is shown as this red strand, and it is base paired by the rules of Watson-Crick base pairing with the RNA substrate, which is shown uh, as the black strand. And you can see that the yellow arrow is pointed to cleave the black strand. And as many proteins have an active site cleft, this RNA enzyme has an active site cleft. This paired region number one, consisting of the uh, internal guide sequence paired with the RNA that's going to be cleaved, is nestled in a cleft between the purple and the green domains of the RNA catalyst. So then the complete reaction cycle would look a bit like this. It starts out with the substrate as a separate molecule from the ribozyme. You can see the internal guide sequence is hanging out sort of like the tongue of a snake waiting uh, to interact by uh, proper collision with the substrate. When they do collide in the right way, they form base pairs and then this paired region docks into the active site cleft between the two domains. At that point, if guanosine is present, it can attack the uh, substrate strand, 
cleaving off, becoming attached to it by transesterification. One of the products leaves very rapidly, and then the other cleavage product, which is held on by base pairing and by interactions uh, between the backbone of the helix and the catalyst, comes off much more slowly. And in fact, in the multiple turnover reaction, which means when the catalyst recycles and each catalyst cleaves multiple substrates, the slow step in this entire um, cycle, if you have, as, assuming that you have a, enough of the RNA substrate to always fill the active site, is this product release step. So it zips through all of these steps and then there's sort of a slow release of one of the cleavage fragments before you get back to the point where the free catalyst can encounter and interact with the new substrate molecule. Now the next two slides uh, are a little interlude at a little bit of a more advanced level because students often ask me, well, what kind of experiments can you possibly do to address these questions? And I find that it's very easy for a scientist to talk to uh, a group of high school students about the results of experiments and what it is that we think we've learned, but it takes a lot more training for students to be able to understand the process by which the experiments are actually done and interpreted. So I'm going to give you a little glimpse into that process. If you don't understand the next two slides, don't be concerned because I'll return to more descriptive uh, material in a minute. So this is uh, actual experimental data, the sort of which that is generated uh, many, many times per day in the laboratory. That we start out with a radioactively labeled substrate RNA that is uncleaved. The, the nucleotide sequence of that substrate is shown on the top, and it's radioactively labeled using an isotope of phosphorus called phosphorus 32, which uh, emits beta particles, and only the left end of the molecule is labeled so that when this substrate is cleaved into products, even though there are two products, you only see uh, one of them, the one that is at the left end, because that's the only one that's radioactively labeled. This uh, radioactive labeling is done because we're working with extremely small amounts of material, and it would be difficult to detect the material by uh, a standard chemical analysis the phosphorus 32 provides a, a very sensitive technique and only very small amounts of the radioactivity are needed because we have very sensitive ways of measuring where the radioactivity is, the simplest of which is to just take a piece of x-ray film like you would find in a hospital and in the dark room just place the x-ray film over the experiment, come back the next day, remove it and develop it just like you would any piece of film, and then the exposed silver grains show you the location of the phosphorus 32. One thing rem remains to be described, and that is how do we separate the uncleaved substrate from the cleaved product? And this is using gel electrophoresis, which I described briefly yesterday, that the molecules uh, in the influence of an electric field electrophoresis from top to bottom. The smaller ones go faster, and so this provides then the separation between substrate and product. And you can see that as time goes on, in the presence of a ribozyme, this uh, substrate RNA is cleaved to give this product and that in this particular experiment uh, it depends on the concentrations of the various ingredients how fast this would actually take place but in this particular experiment you can see that by 10 minutes there's been essentially complete conversion of the starting RNA to the cleaved products. We then uh, quantitate the amount of substrate and product at each time point and make a, a graph that shows the fraction of the substrate remaining uncleaved, so that starts out at, at 1 because it's all intact. We plot the amount of substrate remaining as a function of time, and you can see that depending on the amount of guanosine, remember guanosine is the little scissors that are cleaving the RNA, depending on the amount of guanosine present, we either get this straight line or at a higher uh, amount of guanosine, we get this line, or at an even higher 
three millimolar amount of guanosine, we get a faster rate. And then from the slope of each of these lines and many more lines that I haven't shown you, we can make a plot then of uh, the rate of the reaction as a function of the guanosine concentration. And this shows a behavior which is very similar to what a protein enzyme would show. Namely, at low concentrations, the uh, rate increases proportionally to the guanosine concentration. But then you come to a point where the rate is constant. You get to a maximum velocity, in this case, about 8 times 10 to the minus 2 per minute, which uh, no matter how much guanosine you put in, you don't exceed that limiting or maximum velocity. And that's because at that point, the guanosine binding site is all, always full. And so adding more guanosine doesn't help the reaction because there's enough guanosine in solution to keep that guanosine binding site occupied. So from this sort of an experiment uh, and others not shown, we can get uh, an estimate of the affinity of the ribozyme for guanosine, and we can see that uh, it's binding guanosine, it's half occupied at about 0.5 millimolar guanosine concentration. So this gives you a bit of a glimpse of the laboratory procedures that one would have to go through in order to evaluate uh, a catalyst, in this case an RNA catalyst, but very similar methods would be used for uh, evaluating a protein catalyst. I'd now like to turn to the question of how is the rate acceleration achieved and a substitution of a single atom right at the cleavage site, uh, experiments done by Joe Picciarelli, a, a former postdoctoral fellow in the, in the laboratory, have been very revealing in this regard. We compared the cleavage, so this is the phosphorus atom at which the guanosine attacks. Uh, and so this is the bond that's actually going to be broken in the first step of the self-splicing reaction or in this RNA enzyme system that's analogous to the uh, self-splicing reaction. We compared the activity or the rate of cleavage with two different atoms in position X. Oxygen would be the normal occupant of that particular site if this was regular RNA or in this case, it's actually, um, for ease of synthesis, we did this as a single-stranded DNA molecule. There's no hydroxyl group in this position. And the ribozymes will cleave single-stranded DNA, although they do so much more slowly than they cleave RNA. We compared then the cleavage of the oxygen-containing substrate with a uh, three-prime sulfur-substituted substrate. And you know from your studies in chemistry of the periodic table the relationship between oxygen and sulfur, right? How are they related to each other? Somebody remember? They're in the same, they're in the same group, so they're very good. So they're one right on top of the other, which means that they have very similar chemical and bonding properties, but they have differences as well. And in this case, we substituted sulfur because uh, from a chemist's point of view, that should make it much, more, much easier to cleave the bond between that atom and the phosphorus uh, because the negative charge that's going to uh, accumulate on this atom when the bond is broken is going to be uh, more easily accommodated by the, the sulfur than the oxygen. And so this should speed up the reaction a lot. And when we did the experiment, we found that the uh, normal phosphate-containing substrate was cleaved to completion as expected and completely opposite to expectation. This three prime sulfur containing molecule was not cleaved at all. And so this was a disappointing result because it had taken many weeks in the uh, fume hood to synthesize this variant molecule and we had expected that it would be cleaved more quickly and instead it was not cleaved at all. Uh, one possible reason that something might not be cleaved would be if it didn't even bind to the catalyst. But we had an independent way of analyzing binding shown in the table here, and you can see that the three prime sulfur containing substrate had a binding constant that you know, this is uh, expressed as a dissociation 
constant. So in fact, this is about two and a half times tighter, more tightly bound than the normal substrate. But the main point is that it's bound at a similar, to a similar extent as the uh, three prime oxygen containing RNA. So that wasn't the explanation. And yet we had this very large amount, if we strained our eyes and our instrument used sophisticated instrumentation, we could detect a little bit of cleavage, but it was a thousand fold reduced from that of the uh, normal nucleic acid substrate. So at that point, uh, Pitcher really added just a dash of a different metal ion, manganese, to the reaction, and all of a sudden, the three prime sulfur uh, containing substrate was cleaved quite well, either in the mixture of magnesium and manganese ion or in manganese ion alone. So the ability to cleave this slightly different substrate was restored when a different metal ion was added. Well, what could that mean? And we uh, were reminded of some early work by Mildred Cohen and also some studies done uh, in Mo Cleland's laboratory where the preference for metal binding um, was compared, the ratio of coordinating of a metal ion to oxygen relative to sulfur, which of course was the atomic switch that we had made. Magnesium ion has a huge preference, 31,000 fold, for binding to oxygen relative to sulfur. Manganese is much less fussy and prefers oxygen by only 158 fold. So the explanation then was that uh, there must be a metal ion situated right next to this atom that is part of this bond that is being cleaved in the ribozyme reaction. And that uh, if this atom is oxygen, then magnesium works fine in this site, but when you change it to sulfur, magnesium no longer is effective because it has such a huge preference for binding to oxygen relative to sulfur, but now manganese, swapping manganese into the metal binding site can restore the cleavage. So the idea is that this ribozyme recruits a metal ion from the cellular environment and uses some of the catalytic power of a metal ion to help cleave nucleic acids, a strategy that is very much analogous to that of many protein enzymes. Why does this make sense? Well, here's a picture of uh, the so-called transition state of this reaction. I described this yesterday as the halfway point of the reaction. This dotted line is a bond that's half formed at this instant in time as the guanosine is trying to make an oxygen phosphorus bond uh, at the cleavage site. Remember, it becomes attached to the intron during this reaction. And the other bond shown here is one that's half broken. And as this bond is half broken, there's a redistribution of charge. Charge builds up on this atom. And only by having a metal ion close by can you stabilize that developing negative charge and thereby speed the reaction along. We think this accounts for about a thousandfold or three orders of magnitude of this 11 orders of magnitude of catalysis that we have to explain. Other features such as orienting the attacking guanosine at just the right angle so that it can make a very efficient attack on this chemical linkage is another catalytic strategy that helps speed the reaction along and helps account for that um, very large rate acceleration. So we now summarize in this more complex diagram, now putting back the normal oxygen atom in the RNA substrate and the more normal cofactor magnesium ion, some of the interactions which help stabilize this halfway point or transition state in the chemical transformation and uh, together contribute to making the reaction occur on the time scale of a small fraction of a second as opposed to 100 years. Now, you can see that the ribozyme surrounding the reactive groups has not been shown in any detail here. It's just shown as 
a shaded surface, but you can see that that shaded surface is critical in aligning all of the other players at just the right angle to make an efficient chemical reaction. So the next natural question might be, what is that shape of the RNA catalyst? What, how do you build an active site composed of RNA? RNA is composed of a series of helices, and it's quite easy to understand how you get to that first order of folding. It has to do with A pairing with U, G pairing with C. It has to do with hydrogen-bonded base pairs, very similar to the ones that hold the double helix of DNA together. What is more difficult for us to understand is the question of how do you pack those helices together uh, into a very specific folded entity which is then able to arrange the substrate molecules in just the right way. So it's this higher order of packing which is uh, the subject of a lot of current investigation. One way that you might think of looking at the structure of an RNA molecule would be electron microscopy. And we have done this in collaboration with Yu Wah Wang and Jack Griffith at the University of North Carolina, and the results are at the same time encouraging and frustrating, just like most of experimental science. So the encouraging part is that you can see very discrete globular molecules, and I've been claiming to you that like a protein enzyme, this RNA would have to be globular rather than strung out like the DNA double helix in order to have an active site cleft and act like a catalyst. So it looks globular. The frustrating part is that you can almost imagine seeing some regularity in these globs, but the resolution of electron microscopy just isn't good enough in order to, pick, to be able to pick out specific helical elements within that globular ribozyme or RNA catalyst. And even if you go to higher magnification, you, uh, you, you still you can see some interesting substructure, but you can't quite uh, pick out individual helices. So you need a marker. You need some way of identifying one helix from another. And staring at these pictures, it struck me that perhaps uh, there was a fairly simple solution to this problem. That if we could just, and let's go to tRNA as an example, transfer RNA also would be much too small to visualize its, its detailed structure by electron microscopy. But if we would extend this helical portion of the molecule out to the right and then extend this port helical portion downwards to make sort of reporter arms that would be large enough to see in the electron microscope and then counting on the fact that perfect double helices of nucleic acid are quite rigid rods, we should be able to, to monitor at least the angle between these two. For transfer RNA, using this as a model system, we know that that angle should be about 90 degrees. So we extended the two arms of transfer RNA by 70 base pairs each, looked in the electron microscope, and lo and behold, the transfer RNA itself is this little blob where the two arms meet. You can see there's no detail visible there at all, but you can see the two arms extending, and when you measure the angle between the two arms, you can see that it centers at 90 degrees, and then it has some distribution. They aren't all exactly 90 degrees. Some of them, here's one you can see is a little bit more of an acute angle. Here's one that's a little bit more of an obtuse angle. That may represent the natural flexibility of the two arms with respect to each other, but we also have to worry that there could be some distortion of that angle upon drawing the molecules down onto a surface to do the electron microscopic experiment. So uh, currently we haven't uh, come to a, a clear resolution of what the breadth of this distribution means, so we pay more attention to the angle between the, the two arms. So being encouraged then that this idea of extending the arms of an RNA might be able to give us the angle between the arms in the folded structure and convert an intrinsically low resolution technique to give us a higher resolution view of what's happening in the middle of the molecule, we now go back 
to the ribozyme. Here's a uh, sort of a road map of the tetrahymena intron with uh, the different helical elements shown. And from previous work done in our laboratory, we figured that extension of this arm called P6B, an extension of this paired region called P8, would not interfere with the folding of the molecule. And we, in fact, have an easy way of testing this because we took the molecules with these helical regions extended, used them as catalysts, did the sort of detailed um, monitoring the rate of ribozyme catalyzed cleavage, and we directly showed that extension of these two arms did not perturb the function of the molecule, and therefore it seems to be neutral with respect to the folded structure. So we can then use these extensions as reporter arms. What to, to figure out what the angle between these two uh, helices would be within the folded molecule. What would we expect? Well, from the French model, that of Michel and Westhoff, shown here, if we extend the P8 region, which is this yellow portion, as a helix, and 70 base pairs is in fact much longer than this, but we ran out of room on the slide, so I'm just showing you the first uh, turn and a half of the helix, which is about the first 15 base pairs, it would go out in this direction. If we extended the P6 region, shown in blue, it would go straight down. And again, the expectation, as in the case of tRNA, would be a 90 degree angle. We did the experiment. Here are ribozymes seen in the electron microscope with at all at the same magnification. It's a little lower magnification than I showed you before. Here are ribozymes in their natural state with no helical extensions. Here are ones where we've extended a single helical arm. And now in C and D are ones where we've extended both the paired region 6 and the paired region 8. And you can see that they uh, map out a, a distance, a, a, an angle, which when we measure some hundreds of these molecules, we find out is uh, right at the 90 degree range. We've done this also for pairwise extensions, not only of P8 and the P6 region, but also for extended other helical regions. And we can then get a map of how these helices, what angle they form relative to each other uh, in the folded RNA molecule. Now, the title of this slide is chirality strikes again. Chirality is a Greek word for handedness, and it just has to do with how your, you know, how your left hand relates to your right hand. They uh, have a mirror image symmetry. It's very common in biological molecules for the uh, molecule to be, uh, and it's either the molecule or its mirror image to be the active form. And I'm just pointing out here that from these electron microscopic experiments, we cannot distinguish whether the structure that we've determined is the one on the left or its mirror image shown on the, on the right. From other experiments, it looks like the ribozyme is probably in the form shown on the left. This shows that uh, some Scientists uh, like to be artists in their spare time, so our collaborator, Jack Griffith, decided to digitize some of the images of these ribozymes with their helices extended and arrange them on a uh, red background to make a, an, an artistic view of RNA structure. The editors of the journal where we submitted the paper wanted to know whether they would destroy the scientific validity of this image by turning it upside down, and I assured them that there was no scientific meaning to this particular arrangement of the molecules chasing each other around in a circle, and so that they could uh, put it in on the cover of the journal in any orientation that they wanted. Finally, it's worth saying that uh, this helix extension model, although sort of a fun thing to explain to uh, you today is a pretty low resolution technique. And we are trying to achieve a level of resolution where we can see every atom in the molecule in its correct location at very high resolution. 
This has been done for the transfer RNA molecule. That beautiful picture I keep showing you that's sort of the purplish color was determined by X-ray crystallography. That has been the world's record for the largest RNA molecule that could be, whose structure could be completely determined by growing crystals. And you know in a crystal the molecules are all lined up in the same orientation, one right after another, so that when you shine an X-ray beam through that ordered array of molecules, then from the diffracted spots of uh, the X-ray, you can re reconstitute a picture of what the individual structure of, of each molecule must have looked like. So we've been working very hard to grow crystals of ribozymes or large portions of the ribozyme, and you can see that uh, from this picture that we've had some success, and in fact in the last month we've had a breakthrough in the um, solution of the crystal structure of a, a large domain of the ribozyme about twice the size of transfer RNA uh, in collaboration with uh, Jennifer Doudna's laboratory at Yale University uh, where uh, Jennifer was a former uh, associate in the laboratory and we've now, now that she's gotten her independent faculty position, we continue to work on this project collaboratively. So hopefully within the next year, you will see a domain of the ribozyme uh, in a uh, scientific magazine of some sort portrayed at the level not just of the angle between helices, but at the level of where the individual atoms are actually located. And so uh, thank you for your attention and I'll uh, be glad to take questions. Yes? So the question is, are there any inhibitors that, that compete for binding to the active site of the ribosome? So uh, we've uh, investigated the possibility of, of inhibitors, uh, in part because there are some pathogenic organisms that have these ribozymes, and it might be interesting to ask the question, uh, could you inhibit this pathogen by by interfering with its self-splicing RNA. Uh, so far we've found two separate kinds of inhibitors that I think make a lot of sense with respect to the mechanism that I showed you. One is a, a, a guanosine molecule that is similar enough to normal guanosine that it can bind into the guanosine binding site, but it doesn't have uh, a three prime hydroxyl group, this OH group, so that it can do the attack. So that sort of inhi an inhibitor does shut down the reaction, um, but it has to be used at very high concentrations, so I'm not sure that it's of, of, in order to fill up the binding site, so I'm not sure that uh, from a medical point of view it would be very useful. This is a bit similar to one of the HIV drugs that is being used, with, which is the AZT, the azitothymine or thymidine, which is uh, something that, that is the, uh, one of the enzymes of the virus is fooled into using instead of a normal nucleotide, but then it can't do the, uh, the, the correct reaction. And so that's the same sort of idea that uh, any catalyst that utilizes nucleotides as one of its substrates, you can usually find an, uh, a slightly different version of the nucleotide which will bind but then not do the job and then that will act as an inhibitor. The second type of inhibitor that we can use is a short piece of nucleic acid that binds to that internal guide sequence and competes with the uh, recognition of the exon by the intron. And again, that works very well in the test tube, but I'm not sure that anything like that normally goes on in, in cells. So in the cell, I, I don't know if there are competitors that are, uh, that are of significant problems for the, for the system. Yes? Yeah, uh, I was wondering if the uh, ribozymes like, mimic the protein enzymes and that um, the rate of reaction is affected by uh, pH and uh, heat. Have you all done any tests for that? pH and, uh, heat, like and heat. heat. Yes, so the question is, does an RNA catalyst 
uh, change its activity as you change pH or temperature in a way that you might expect from studies of protein catalysts? And the answer is uh, yes, and, and those uh, dependencies are often rather revealing about how the reaction works. Uh, for example, we find that as you go to more and more from acidic conditions, more and more towards basic conditions, the rate of the reaction speeds up a lot, which suggests that you've got to pull a proton off of some entity in the molecule in order for the reaction to occur. And that's easier to do in a more alkaline solution. If you have a more acidic solution with a lot of, a lot of hydrogen ions around, you're putting hydrogen ions onto the molecule, and that makes the reaction slow down. We think that the key proton that has to be removed is, the, is from the guanosine itself, that that OH has to, that the H has to be removed from the OH in order for the guanosine to act as an effective pair of scissors to cleave the RNA chain. And the temperature dependence, uh, as in many enzyme reactions, as you raise the temperature, the reaction goes faster and faster very common for chemical reactions. And then if you raise the temperature enough, it stops completely. And why, is, why do you think that is? Why at high temperature might the reaction not work at all? Go ahead. In the blue shirt. It denatures it. Right. It denatures it. So that, as I've been trying to stress, the folded structure is critical for catalysis. At a high enough temperature, entropy takes over, the chain unfolds, and now it can't do anything. So you get this interesting temperature dependence. As you go to uh, temperatures that are above body temperature, the reaction towards what you'd find in a hot spring at, in Yellowstone or something, the, the uh, temperature, the re reaction goes faster and faster, and then you get to sort of temperatures closer to where water boils and the reaction quits entirely because the catalyst no longer retains its shape. So that was a good question. Yes? Um, when you extend the length or the arms of the, of the ribosome, how do you know uh, which base pairs to use? So the question was when we extend the arms of the ribosome so that we can visualize it in the electron microscope, how do we know what base pairs to use? And um, we didn't spend a lot of time worrying about that. We just made a stretch of, of uh, A's, uh, U's, G's, and C's, and then oh, much further on, we made a sequence that was complementary, so, so that there would always be a, a, a match going across the helix. Y you might imagine that, that you'd have to worry a lot about it, because if you didn't choose exactly the right sequence, it might fold in some other way, in some branched way, rather than as a straight rod. And so we do, you do use computer programs to check out your sequence and see if they predict that it'll fold as a simple rod or possibly in some alternative way. And we chose a sequence. The computer program said it folded, would fold correctly. And according to the electron microscope, it looks like most of the time they fold correctly, maybe not 100%. In the back. Does RNA behave like a protein enzyme in that it has to be, um, it's unchanged after use, or does it have to be reintroduced into the system over a period of time? So the question is, does an RNA enzyme act like a protein enzyme in that it uh, will keep going and going and going, sort of like the uh, EverReady battery, or uh, does it have to be reintroduced uh, to the system after a certain amount of time? And uh, in, in principle, it's, it's uh, limitless in, its, in the number of reactions that, that it can uh, catalyze. It, it, we've tested it, uh, for example, after, it's, after the catalyst has been working overnight, we've added fresh substrate RNA, and it continues to cleave the added substrate at the same rate that a fresh batch of the catalyst it taken right out of the refrigerator. So it doesn't appear to have lost any of its activity overnight. But I think the real answer is that for either a protein catalyst or uh, an RNA catalyst, there will always be some uh, competing pathways. For example, um, denaturation or unfolding of the catalyst itself. And so you don't expect it to, that's why I said in principle it would uh, you would never have to restore it. It would always keep working. In practice, n nothing is ever 100 percent 
um, uh, dependable, and in this case, there would be some loss of activity over time. But it's sim I would say it's similar to a protein, typical protein catalyst in that regard. Way in the back. Was uh, magnesium the cofactor that helped the rate the most out of the metal ions that you tried? question was, was magnesium ion the, the metal ion cofactor that was most effective of the metal ions we tried? And the answer is that um, uh, for the normal RNA substrate, not, not the altered one with the sulfur, either magnesium or manganese have a very similar activity. When we substituted the sulfur, we found that zinc worked quite well, and zinc is known to be a thiophilic or sulfur-loving um, ion, and so that fit in with the, with the model that I presented and provided some further evidence for it. Other metal ions that are common in cells, like calcium ion, are not able to substitute. And um, so there is a, a moderate amount of specificity for particular metal ions, and, and there is not, it does not have the ability to use just any metal ion that would be in the cell. Uh, but it, it seems to be choosing uh, in the natural form either magnesium or manganese. Last question, anyone? Yes. Have any of the RNA catalyzed reactions been up to speed up during cell division or other cell processes? You mean as, so as if they would be regulated? Right. And so the question is, have any of the RNA catalysts been shown to speed up during cell division or in a particular uh, cellular state? And the answer is that, that uh, there's been a lot of talk about such possibilities, but I think the truth is there's no clear example for uh, regulation of a ribozyme activity as a function of the cell cycle or, or some other environmental condition. Well, thank you very much for your excellent questions. I want to thank Tom for his lucid presentation on his work on the structure and function relationships of catalytic sites of ribozymes. His next talk will focus on his work on RNA, whose target is the ends of chromosomes, which hold the secrets not only for the aging of the cell, but paradoxically for its immortality as well.